1990s, the city of El Cajon, California, began experiencing a drastic increase in gang activity and violence. This was evidenced by numerous stabbings, shootings, and an increase in gang crimes. I had been on the police department just over a year when I found myself confronted with the task of dealing with these gang members. After responding to a call of a stabbing at a local probation school, I began to see the work God would lay out for me. Judging the heart, overlooking the outside, an El Cajon police officer's motto. We introduce you to a cop who has learned how to bridge the gap. When he first became an officer, he says, he thought he could fight youth violence with force. Now he knows he has to fight with his heart. And, and I'll tell you right now, though, you're going to get people to buy into you more instead of talking by just doing it. You want the community to buy into you in this. And then I go to the community and hear them saying, well, why won't these kids just give us a chance? We want to help them. To really, really let our heart reach out to these kids and love them and, and back them up and support them. Just by, just by believing in these kids, just by believing in them and loving them, that's what's going to take to reach them. So that you get them out here and they're out of their environment, they act completely different. And that's kind of the neat thing about getting them out on the water. It brings the little kid out in them. A group of friends and I founded a program called Bridge the Gap, which was composed of a boxing program, building houses in Mexico, and other outings which we used as a catalyst to capture the hearts of these gang members. One such gang member was Lalo Gunther. From the moment I set my eyes on him, I knew there was something very special about him, and God had a special plan laid out for his life. Unfortunately, Lalo would have to endure serious consequences due to his dangerous lifestyle. As I walk through these streets again, it brings back many memories. Memories of things that happened here, memories of uh, the criminal activities that took place, pain and suffering that uh, was caused here. It was this place where I joined a gang. Uh, there had been a gang that had moved here from Orange County, and many of the family members, their relatives, have all had all moved to the same location, the same street, Leslie Road. There was always 20, 30, 40 gang members out here on the streets. I remember coming on patrol and I turned down Leslie Road here in the police car and every time I turned the corner I'd see this group of gangsters right over here. I can remember, I remember seeing the complex because I let the dispatch know I was at, in front of 964 Leslie so I always remember that address. When I tried to contact you and you were real hard with me, well, I was remembering uh, at one point when I told the older gangsters if I see you guys even talking to this guy I will find any reason I can to impound your cars, arrest you, whatever. I think police officers don't realize the impact they can have on young people and, and being a protector in the, in the communities. For the, these guys don't have to affiliate with gangsters. I can remember at times when people that lived in the complex, good families would move out because of the gang members and pretty soon the gangs occupied a majority of the units here in the complex. It felt like unity, like we were all united as one. Uh, I had a gang member that lived under, on, down, downstairs from me, another one right across from me, another one uh, uh, two two rooms down across the street. If I ever needed something, I would call them. And that family that I, that, that family connection that I didn't have with my own family, I established with them. I think I was 15 years old. Uh, and when you came to, to knock on the door, I seen a different side of you. I remember being with you at different events, seeing a, a, one, a certain side of you, almost a loving, caring side. And at the same time, when you would come to arrest me, like on that occasion, uh, I seen almost like a bulldog come out of you. Even though you arrested me, even though you took me to juvenile hall, uh, respected you as a person, and deep down inside I didn't want to give you a place in my heart, but I already had given you a place in my heart. Actually, you believed in me more than I believed in myself. I still was, uh, it's almost like I'm, I'm a plant ready to, to blossom, and I was blossoming, but I was corrupting myself. It's crazy coming back here. Yeah, it is. The uh, first seven or eight years of my life brings back a lot of memories. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, biggest ones for me was the uh, drive-by shooting. Happened around 3 a.m. or so. There was about three or four bullet shots that uh, went through the window, and they actually went through the window and into the wall, and they were definitely trying to get to someone. When there was like, probably like 10 cop cars lined up. It, it used to be a uh, well-known site for the El Cajon Police Department who used to come here different reasons on search warrants. Uh, when he used to walk in, Lalo's bedroom used to be right there. Lalo's lifestyle affected us uh, tremendously. Uh, it was definitely a hardship for our family. Uh, my mom, uh, you know, single mom, raising five kids. 
Uh, it wasn't easy. You know, he wasn't that brother that uh, we needed, you know, during that time of our life. And uh, we, didn't, we didn't have anybody to look to. <clears throat> yeah, it's tough, like, with my mom because, I mean, she wasn't well-educated, so she couldn't, like, go out there and look for a better job that, where she could be making more money, so she just had to deal with what she could get and what, what she was doing. I mean, housekeeping, I mean, she wasn't getting paid that well, so, I mean, just doing that and then trying to feed us all and paying rent, it was tough. Five separate occasions I was actually taken to this facility. This is Juvenile Hall, San Diego. Uh, first time, first instance, I was 15 years old. I remember being very scared. Police officers bringing me here. This is going to be very hard. There's a lot of uh, testing you're going to have to endure. Be forced to, uh, to fight a bunch of people. Uh, subjected to all kinds of different treatments that I had not been aware of. Probably the third time I was actually in Juvenile Hall. I was thinking to myself, this is such a, a horrible place. And to realize that I, at 17 years old, I could be spending the rest of my life in a facility as this, and then moving on to prison forever. I always thought about my younger siblings and just how I hoped that they would never join a gang or be involved in any uh, gang lifestyle to wind up in a place like this. This place is very hurtful, and I wish that I was not living the life that I was but when I was released, uh, somehow the, the yearning, the drawing to the gang lifestyle uh, pulled me back in. And, and I, once again, I would find myself here again. It wasn't uh, until the last time uh, I was brought here, I was arrested for attempted murder. Lalo and two other gang members, armed with a handgun, set out to retaliate against a rival gang. When they could not locate their intended target, Lalo drove by a 7-Eleven located near Bradley and Mollison where they located a gang member who was unknown to them. The passenger fired numerous shots out of the window, striking the victim in the leg. The victim survived the attack, however sustained permanent damage due to the shot hitting an artery. When I was in maximum security, I was there with the worst of the worst, I would say, in San Diego. Even as a news article stated about us, there was a a guy in there, Tony Hicks, 14 years old, he had killed a pizza man as an, an initiation uh, to get involved into the gang that he was from. There was also another young kid, Jared, he found out he was adopted and he killed both of his, his adoptive parents, his adoptive grandparents, and his 10-year-old uh, adoptive sister. In 1995, things began to change for me. Being incarcerated for over a year, I realized that there was more to life. I realized that I didn't want to live this life anymore. At that point, my mother brought me in a Bible, and I would begin to read this Bible, and I've been a different person ever since. It was now into my heart to touch other people, to give people uh, something more. I looked at my family members, I looked at my younger brothers and sisters, and I wanted something better for them. I wanted to come out of this a better person. I didn't want to be the same person that I was when I came, when I entered this place. I wanted to leave different, if that was ever going to be the case. I remember my first occasions coming into Juvenile Hall and this police officer, Kevin LaChapelle, whose name still rings in my heart as he'd come to visit me here. The same police officer would arrest me on the streets, uh, would come in to visit me. He would write me in here. He would continue to have a burden for me. When I was on the streets, I didn't have that same care for him that he cared for me. But I realized through time that he was pretty much the only person that stood by me. He had more love for me than any one of my family members or any one of my past gang members. He loved me with, with a, an unconditional type of love that I have not ever experienced. I remember seeing a gray vehicle like this, an undercover car. I remember when you would turn, turn the corner, come down our street, and I'd say, does this man in this vehicle, does he love me? Is he here to look out after me? Or is he here to arrest me? I was in a, in a dilemma to understand that. I knew deep down inside, I think, that, that you cared for me, but at the same time I knew that I was breaking the law in so many areas that you could arrest me at any time. So when you would come, I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't know how to react. I remember the different times, I think it was on two occasions, that you actually brought me to this facility. It's kind of the same dilemma. I'm turning the corner, seeing someone that I know has potential, that I knew didn't understand where he was carrying himself 
that he was allowing other people to influence him and propel him into evilness and a, and a destructive lifestyle. But I also remember um, the impact of you actually having influence and you and I together as a team really exerting some strong influence in this facility, not only to inmates, but also to different probation officers. When I was 18, on my birthday, they sent me to this county jail from Juvenile Hall. I was in this county jail for approximately nine months. I remember this cell exactly. This is 2C. Everyone here is a lot older than I am, full of tattoos, been in the gang lifestyle for many years. Before they had started rioting, I had just been sitting in my cell on my bed reading my Bible. Uh, I could hear all this rumbling going on. Mexicans approached me and asked me why didn't I get involved? Why didn't I uh, back them up and represent the, the Mexicans, represent the, the gang members? And I said, you know, I'm not part of you guys. I'm a different person. I stand for different things. One of them proceeded to, uh, to start punching me repeatedly. Then I was beat up by at least two of them. One of them sticking his fingers in, in my eye sockets. Try and it felt to me like he was trying to pull my eyes out. The ironic part about it, this occurred three days before my sentencing. I remember using the phone that night, being beat up. I get this call from Lalo and I could tell, I was pretty discerning in my conversation with him, and I could tell that he was talking in code. In other words, I could tell there were people next to him to which he really couldn't speak freely to me. He asked me, how things going? Which I did not respond to. So he picked up very, very quickly. He said uh, he'd make a phone call again. He said, they're gonna move me for sure this time. The next morning, Kevin comes in to visit me. He even brought in a newspaper. He snuck in a camera. I remember him putting, placing the newspaper next to my face as he's seen all the bruises on my face, the scars all over my face, the swollen ear, the blood stains, the blood all over my clothing. He had been beaten so badly that I, I was stunned at the bruising, and I was really stunned that the deputies offered no medical attention to him whatsoever. God, why did you allow this to happen? As I stand here as a young kid, attempting to stand for you, to make a difference in this place for you, uh, you allow this to happen to me. 1997, I remember the feeling coming to this place. I was scared seeing the barbed wire and the high fences. Uh, from the stories I remember hearing from the people in county jail, the older people, they said, uh, I never want to go to youth party. It's a gladiator school. There's problems all the time. Stabbing, shooting, riots. I remember uh, virtually every other day uh, seeing the riot police being out there. The staff members, she was a, a counselor, she was actually killed here at this place. Under the youth authority, it's all about proving yourself. Everybody wants to know who you are and what you're about. To be a physician, a war rights specialist. I actually dealt with the whole grievance procedure. If people had a problem, they came to me. I was, uh, in one sense, I was one of the highest ranking inmates in this place. I will never forget the day Jose and I picked up Lalo, who had just been released from the California Youth Authority in the year 2000. We immediately reunited Lalo with his family in Lakeside, California. And I opened up the door and it was Lalo. And I, I, I couldn't believe it, you know, because I had heard that he, he uh, got a uh, big sentence. And I remember my mom, she used to tell us that he was away in college. But after I found out the truth, you know, you put it all together, the lifestyle that he was living, and him going to college, it didn't make sense. Yeah, I remember when he came in, like, like he said, I mean, you just stare at him and you kind of like, it takes you like a minute just to figure out who he is because you haven't seen him for such a long time. It was something that I was thankful for to uh, see him there. And uh, when he walked in, he got to see uh, firsthand the uh, different things that were going on. Uh, you know, not much to eat in the refrigerator. And, you know, we suffered. I remember my mom would always be very desperate to try to make sure there's food on the table for us. And there's many times I remember going to the Safeway on Chase and Avocado and waiting for the, the, the grocer to come out and dump the produce and dump all the spoils into the trash can. I remember me and my sister would jump inside the trash can and we'd find tomatoes, we'd find a lettuce. I mean, it was just her working, you know. I was working too at the time helping her out a little bit, but uh, it was tough. I mean, you know, five kids, you know, and, and no dad. Oh, if I had a dad, that was always there for me.
telling me stuff like you're my princess and everything I would love that because we are never with him so we don't know how he is I only know he gambles a lot and just spends money on stupid things and just to live through my life without my father it, it was really hard and to have my mom there even though she's not like a, the huggable type the oh I love you and stuff like that she's not like that she stressed a lot and all the, all the work that she had to do for all of us now I know how to care for my kids and love them and always say I love to them I'm gonna be what I never got for my kids it's very hard very hard uh, working and take care and taking school and go to the store and shopping for the food and sometimes no food and made me worry and to work and come in and, and my and my break and keep it to the food for my children and Lalo is babysitter when the Harley is small and Ryan and Vanessa and I said take care and I coming back in 30 minutes and my break and running and and so hard for me I said to God why my son, one my son, my son, again. I don't always pray and I say, please, I give it to you, God. And I said, Lord, help me with my son, please. And say, help me. When I say, yeah, I don't sleep. <laughs> Sorry, I cry and I stand up and I can't sleep. Because I'm so worried for something to happen inside. <laughs> oh, I'm so surprised. I'm so happy when I see him. Very happy when I see him. Very happy. He made me alive again. <laughs> and thank you, you Kevin, because you always help me. <laughs> always. <laughs> <laughs> when I first met Lalo in guitar class, I first noticed about him his faith and his love for his family, and uh, that really caught my eye because those are some of my own passions. And I looked to him as a leader, and that is what most attracted me to him. Um, and later when I found out about his past, uh, I was really taken back because that is not who he is today. And uh, I love who he is today because he is passionate, he is compassionate, and and I respect him as a man. I think Lalo has struggled with his past in being open and forthright with people because he's afraid people will reject him. And he was rejected so many times that, that I can understand and accept that. We found out by mistake. He was going on a trip to Ireland and they were holding back because he had to go meet with his pro officer. My wife and I said, oh, I wonder who his pro officer he's meeting with, who's, who he's helping out. And uh, then we found out that it was Lalo's parole officer, and I felt uh, a multitude of thoughts and impressions. And so I wanted to hear from him. I wanted him to come and explain to me. And I was, I, I, quite frankly, I was disappointed that, that I felt he had, he had kind of deceived us in the it first place. It would be difficult for him to face re rejection. and. Uh, be put off by people again and so I told him I loved him a few years ago I found out I had cancer and I've gotten to the point where I thank God for my cancer because it has placed a new heart in me for people 
And Lalo was the one that really got me provoked, would be the best word, to turn back to God, that, that God can take all these things and the experiences of life and has a good purpose for it. I remember the first time we had we had to we had to have a talk, and that was uh, because me and Dara were having issues. Maybe I wasn't treating her the way she should have been treated, the way she needed to be treated. I, I had a fear inside my heart because I didn't know what it would be like. Uh, and you shared nothing but uh, love, and acceptance. You truly opened your heart to me. I would give my life for Lala.